Hey guys, it's a sourdough baker. Today, I'm gonna show you how to make your very own sourdough starter from scratch. To do this, we're gonna need a few pieces of very basic equipment, which hopefully you already have sitting around your house. Let's get to it. The first thing that you're going to need is a small glass jar. This jar is about eight ounces in size, and that is all that you're going to need to build your starter. If you wanna double this and get two glass jars just to keep your jars clean and rotate with every feed, that is awesome, that is how I feed, but it is not necessary to get started. You only need to have one jar. The second thing that you need is something to cover your jar. We wanna use something that is going to keep in moisture but still allow for ventilation. So in this video, I'm going to use a lid, but you can also use plastic cling wrap with a rubber band, or you don't even have to use rubber band. You could use a damp paper towel with a rubber band, you could use a damp cloth, or you can use beeswax wrap. The third item is kind of optional, but not really optional. If you don't have one of these, go get one because I promise you're going to use it every single time that you bake sourdough bread and it's going to make for a lot more accurate feeding of your starter. And that is a kitchen scale. This one was $8.50 off of Amazon. I highly recommend they're not expensive. Go get you a kitchen scale. I'm gonna use a scale in this video, but I will also tell you what to do if you decide not to do a scale and to use volume measurements instead. Some kind of stirring utensil is also essential for mixing up the flour and water that we are going to put in your jar. And of course, now let's talk about the two most essential items to creating a starter, and that is your flour and your water. So flour, you can use any type of flour. You can use whole wheat flour, you can use regular all-purpose flour, you can use bread flour, but why would you? Because it's more expensive. You can even make starter with gluten-free flour. Any type of flour that you wanna make your starter with will work. Will they all look a little bit different? Yes, they will rise and be ready on different timelines, but a starter can be made from any type of flour that you choose. Just don't use bleached flour because bleach will kill a starter. So unbleached flour all the way, but other than that, there are it's there's so much freedom. A lot of people like to use whole wheat flour, rye flour, or einkorn flour to really help boost their starter, especially in the beginning days, or even continuing on to starter maintenance. That's because these flours are really attractive for the yeast that we're trying to harvest in our starter. And so you'll see a lot more activity when you use a percentage of these flours in your mixture or if you use it for 100% of your mixture. Another thing that will kill a starter is chlorine. So with that being said, I like to just use filtered water all the time because I think it's better, but you can use tap water absolutely if your water is not contaminated with chlorine. If it has chlorine in it, you must use filtered water or else you're not gonna see any activity in your jar. Let's talk about temperature for a second. The temperature that you keep your starter at is greatly going to affect how much activity you see. Now, the ideal temperature for a starter is 78 degrees Fahrenheit, but I know that we can't all keep it at 78 degrees Fahrenheit. You can absolutely keep your starter on the counter, and that's what most people do. You just have to be aware that in the winter months when it's cooler especially, you're not going to see as much activity as quickly, and that's okay. That might just mean that in the beginning days, you have to feed it less often, and that's even easier, right? So in this video, I'm going to make two starters. The first one, I'm going to keep at room temperature. We are approaching winter here, and actually there's a cold front going on right now, so it's very cold. Our house is pretty chilly most of the time, except when I'm baking, and I'm just going to keep this one on the counter so that you can know what kind of activity to expect in cooler varying temperatures, such as would be on your kitchen counter in the winter. The second starter that I'm going to make, I'm going to keep in my toaster oven, which does have a proof setting on it. I'm going to set it to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm going to keep it there all the time. So while this one will have varied room temperatures, this one will have a very consistent temperature that is closer to the ideal temperature that a starter likes to be kept at. And hopefully you'll be able to see that no matter what your climate is or when you're making this starter, that you're doing a good job and keep going. And here's what it's going to look like. Let's get to it. I'm gonna go ahead and add my jar to my scale and turn it on so that it tears to zero. 
Now what we want to do is add equal amounts of flour and water by weight. This is really important because it's not going to be this way if you do it by volume. It's actually going to be a different ratio. But by weight equal parts flour and water. So I'm just going to use 10 grams of flour and 10 grams of water here because I don't want to be wasteful and I will build off of this. You can use any weight that you want as long as it is equal parts flour and water by weight. So I'm gonna try to aim for 10 grams of water, but if I don't hit it exactly, it's not a big deal. Seven, nine, we're gonna go with nine. <laughs> That's pretty close. Just wiping that up there. And then I'm going to tear that out and add the same amount of flour, so nine grams of flour. Six, eight, nine. All right, so I've got my flour and water in the jar. I don't need my scale anymore. I'm just gonna mix that up. Really good, I'm gonna get all the clumps out of there. Sorry, not trying to shake the camera. And like I said, any type of flour will work for this. You will create a starter no matter what you do. They're all just going to look a little bit different in how quickly you get your starter. Okay. And you can see our consistency there. It's not super liquidy, but it's also not dry. Everything's nice and wet. A little bit pasty, I guess you could say. I'm going to go ahead and scrape this off the spoon and cover it with my lid. Now I'm using a lid here. Um, you can just loosely tie it on. You don't want to completely lock all that air in. You want there to be some ventilation, but you also want to trap the moisture inside. So loose cover with a lid, and I'm gonna go set this at room temperature so that it can ferment, and I'll get back to you tomorrow. Okay, so that is it for day one. Just to reiterate, on day one, what we're doing is we're taking 10 grams of water and 10 grams of flour, we're putting them in a glass jar, mixing it together so that you can't see any of the flour and it's all well mixed. It'll have this pasty consistency and that is exactly what we're looking for. Remember that any type of flour will work here. We're gonna cover it with some type of covering that will hold in moisture, but it will also allow for ventilation. Then we're gonna let it sit in our desired location for 24 hours. Remember that room temperature is fine, just depending on the room temperature, that's going to affect how much activity that you see. And the ideal temperature for a starter to be kept at is about 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have that, that is the perfect temperature for you to see heightened starter activity and to get your journey moving quickly. I'm going to keep my two starters at different temperatures so that you can see the difference in activity. And I will meet you back here in 24 hours to show you what to do next. Hey guys, welcome back. It has been 24 hours since we made our starter. Here we are on day two, and there's quite a difference in what the room temperature starter looks like versus the starter that was kept in my toaster oven at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So based on the activity that I see, I'm actually gonna treat these starters differently. So let's take a look at them and I will show you what I'm gonna do in these two situations. All right, let's start by taking a look at my room temperature starter. So this one was kept on my counter. It was pretty cold. I didn't bake anything today, so nothing to really heat up the kitchen. It's pretty plain. I don't see any bubbles on top that shine. There's a little bit of liquid separation from the water. That's okay. If you want to give it a stir here, you can, but that's totally optional. Okay, looking at the sides. Notice there's not really a lot of bubbles here. When your starter is fermenting like we want it to, you're going to see bubbles. And there's not really any of that here. And on the bottom, you can see a little, but not really a lot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna leave this for another 24 hours and I am not going to feed it today because I wanna see a lot more activity, a lot more of those yeasts forming before I give it its next feeding. That way we're not diluting anything in the jar.
Okay, now let's take a look at my toaster oven starter, which was kept at 75 degrees Fahrenheit consistently. Look at the difference there. Do you see all those bubbles on top? That is some incredible activity. You can see there's a little bit of orange. I don't know if you can see that like right there. Um, don't be concerned. It's fine. Nothing has contaminated this. Okay, let's look at the sides. Wow, do you see all those bubbles? Bubbles, bubbles, bubbles all around. It's um, it's almost completely doubled, and I can't really show you at this angle. I'll try to show you at a different angle. And the bottom, oh, look at how it's moving. See all those fermentate? Oh, yeah. This is a starter that is ready to be fed on day two. So as you can see, there's quite a difference between the activity level of these two jars just based on the temperature that they were kept at. Everything else about them is the same. This room temperature starter that has fairly, barely any activity, um, I'm not going to do anything to. I am just going to let it sit on the counter for another 24 hours and see how it looks tomorrow and see if it needs to be fed. Right now, there's just not enough activity in it for me to justify adding more flour and water. It would be completely pointless. There's just not enough bacteria that is already developed in this jar. It doesn't need any more flour and water to keep working. This one, on the other hand, um, has completely eaten up all the flour in there. It has multiplied. There's lots of good bacteria in there. And we're going to give it a feeding in order to just help it continue multiplying and growing and become our wonderful starter. I do want to point out one more thing here before I feed these starters. The one that's ready to feed, the toaster oven starter, it may or may not have a pleasant smell. So in the first days, the bacteria, the good bacteria and the bad bacteria, it's almost like a battle. They're fighting each other off. And you're going to see a lot of activity that's going to die down around day three. And that's perfectly normal um, because what's going to happen is that good bacteria that we want to leaven our bread with is going to take over. So if it doesn't smell great in the first few days, Days, that's nothing to be concerned about as long as you don't see anything like mold growing. So just to get my reaction, I'm just going to smell this really fast. It's not terrible. Um, it's not like the clear, pleasant, yeasty smell that I normally smell with my mature starter, but um, it's not horrible today. So this is great. This is ready to be fed. And let me show you how to do that. So for our starter that was kept at 75 degrees Fahrenheit that is ready to be fed, what we're going to do is we're going to feed it equal parts flour and water based on what's already in this jar. Yesterday we fed it 10 grams of flour and 10 grams of water. We mix that together, we let it sit, and now we have some beautiful activity in this jar. 10 grams of flour plus 10 grams of water makes 20 grams of starter. So instead of discarding today, I'm going to add 20 grams of flour. I'm matching the amount of starter that's already in this jar and 20 grams of water. And we're going to let that sit for another 24 hours. All right, here we are on day two. And the only one that I am feeding is this toaster oven starter that is active and ready for more. So I'm just going to set this on my scale and turn it on. Then I'm adding double what's in this jar. So there's 20 grams of starter in this jar based on the 10 grams of flour and the 10 grams of water that we fed it yesterday. So I'm just going to add 20 grams of water or at least as close as I can. 18, 20, hit it right on the money and 20 grams of flour. <laughs> so close. All right. And that's all that we need the scale for. So I'm just going to stir that together. And now you can see we have that same pasty consistency as yesterday. 
except now we have more flour and water in the jar. 60 grams of starter is what we should have by tomorrow. So I'm just going to get the starter off this spoon, loosely return that lid, and there we have it. To reiterate day two, after waiting 24 hours from first mixing our 10 grams of flour and 10 grams of water in the jar, we're going to observe the starter and decide what to do next. If I was just giving generalized directions, I would say go ahead and feed it, but since you have this video and you know what to look for, you can know how to adjust based on what you see. Our room temperature starter was not ready. There was hardly any activity, it was too cold, and we're going to let this sit for even longer. So we're going to let this one sit for 24 hours and not do anything today. This one that was kept in my toaster oven at 75 degrees Fahrenheit was ready for the next step today. So after 24 hours of sitting, I fed it double what was already in this jar. So there was 20 grams of starter already in this jar from yesterday based on the 10 grams of flour and 10 grams of water that we fed it. So to that 20 grams of starter, I'm now adding 20 grams of flour and 20 grams of water to the jar. And I'm going to return it to its location to sit for another 24 hours. I'll see you back here. It has only been 12 hours, but we are needing to monitor and adjust once more. Our toaster oven starter is needing a little bit of TLC. Let me show you what it looks like and why I say that we need to go ahead and adjust. So halfway into day three, wow, look at all that activity. If you look on the sides of this starter, you can actually see that this starter rose all the way to here and now it has fallen. So this rising and falling that has occurred, plus all of these bubbles, tell me that it's ready for another feeding. So let's do that right now. Real quick before I feed it, I do wanna point out the smell. Even though I'm going to discard today, and most days you can save your discard, I'm not going to save this one. And that's because this does not smell like pleasant yeast yet. It smells like, I don't know, like a little bit of dog vomit, but it's it's not that severe because I haven't let it sit for too long. If I let this sit for 24 hours and it had risen and fallen and kept fermenting, it would probably stink pretty bad right now just because we don't have all that good bacteria that has developed and become stable in this jar. So for today, I'm gonna chunk my discard, but in the future, we will be able to save every single thing that we discard. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take my toaster oven starter and I'm going to set it on my scale. Now, usually I switch jars, but today I'm not going to do that. Now it's tear to zero. I'm going to scoop out 40 grams of this starter. So yesterday I fed 20 grams of starter with 20 grams of flour and 20 grams of water. That makes 60 grams of starter total. So I want to take out 40 so that I only have about 20 left in the container. Let's see, that's 13. Ooh, super runny. Making kind of a mess here. This is pretty liquidy. All right, 38, I'm gonna call that close enough. So we've got 38 grams of starter that we took out of there close enough to 40. Probably once I get rid of this stuff that's on the lid, when I clean it, that'll be exactly right. So I'm just gonna tear it out. And now I'm going to add 20 more grams of water. Okay, 20. And 20 more grams of flour. Twenty-one. That's close enough. We're just going to give that a good mix here. We're back to that beautiful paste. That good bacteria will hopefully take over here and we will get a beautiful smelling starter very soon. And 
there you have it. I'm just going to clean the edges here and replace the lid and we'll let it sit for 12 more hours and see where it's at. Just to do a quick comparison with our room temp starter, you can see there's still not a lot going on in here. You can see a little bit of that orange starting to develop. That's not a big deal. You can see some bubbles starting to develop on the side, but not near what we saw yesterday with our toaster oven starter. So it'll probably be ready tonight to go ahead and feed, but we'll check it in 12 hours and see what's going on and see what we need to do to it. Wow, isn't it crazy what temperature can do to a starter? The amount of activity that you see in your own jar at home can greatly vary depending on what temperature it's kept at. And you're gonna need to treat it differently based on what you see in the jar. This room temperature starter, we are only at the beginning of day three and we've only had to mix the flour and water and do nothing else. Here with this toaster oven starter, we've already had to give it two feedings in order to keep it healthy and producing like we want it to. So just because you're not seeing a lot going on in your jar doesn't mean that things aren't working. It just means they're not going as fast. Or if you're seeing a whole bunch go on in your jar, like in this one, you're going to have to monitor and adjust from my original directions in order to keep your starter nice and healthy and get it going and moving more quickly. Okay, it's the end of day three. It has been 12 hours since we fed our toaster oven starter this morning, and it's been 48 hours since we have fed our room temperature starter. Our room temperature starter is finally ready to be fed, and I will show you what that looks like. And our toaster oven starter looks completely different from it, and it is also ready to be fed. So let's look at those two starters and compare so that you know what to expect. As a side note, smell. This is day three, so we are not gonna get that beautiful yeast smell yet. My toaster oven starter has started to develop a smell. It's not super pleasant. Let's just see what my reaction is. Okay, it's not the worst, um, but it's not the best either. It's definitely not ready. I'm not gonna keep any of this discard that we use today, um, but in the future, when it is going a little bit more and it does have that beautiful yeast smell, that's when I'm gonna start saving my discard and I'll use that in discard recipes later on. Okay, so our room temperature starter, nice and bubbly. 48 hours after first mixing the flour and water, we can finally feed it. You'll notice some orange spots on it. That's okay. There's nothing bad in this jar right now. Um, we can go ahead and feed it. We're going to come out with a great starter. Don't toss it out if you see that. Just keep going. I promise it's going to go away. And our toaster oven at the end of day three, 12 af hours after its last feeding. Looks a little bit different, looks a little healthier. You don't see any orange here. That orange is not a cause for concern in the beginning. There is some bad bacteria in here, but that's what the smell is. But it will be overcome. I promise, just keep going. That's what it looks like. So today I actually am going to use a new jar to feed my starter. If you don't want to, you can proceed like we did this morning, but if you do, this is how you would do that. So I'm just going to take my new jar and set it on my scale, tearing it out. And you can add the starter first or you can add the flour and water first, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go ahead and add my flour and water. So we're going to stick with 20 equal parts water, flour, starter. That's 13, 20. And then 20 grams of flour. And 20 grams, oops, and 20 grams of our active starter. Oops, I forgot to tear it out. Just gonna go to 40 here since I forgot to tear it. It's a little bit liquidier than I would like, which tells me that it probably rose and then fell within those 12 hours before we're feeding it here. That's actually a lot of activity. You're not normally gonna see this much activity. It's, it's going to go down over the next few days, 
but for now we're just going to keep rolling with it. Go ahead and give that a good mix. Our toaster oven starter is ready to go. We're going to check it in the morning after 12 hours and see if it needs another feeding. So our room temp starter hasn't actually been fed yet since it hasn't had enough activity for that. So in this jar is just 20 grams of starter from the 10 grams of flour and the 10 grams of water that we fed it two days ago. So I'm not going to use a new jar for this one. I'm just going to add to this jar. So I'm setting it on my scale. And I'm gonna feed it 20 grams of water. And 20 grams of flour. All right, just gonna give that a good stir. Goals to get all that flour incorporated if we can. My spoon's a little bit big. And there you have it. That nice pasty consistency. It's ready to sit for another 24 hours. I want to predict for you what I think is going to happen based on my knowledge and then we'll see how it turns out but just so that you can kind of be aware where this process is going. Let's start with our room temperature starter. This one was kept pretty cold or at least cold for a starter. 70 is probably about the average maybe getting down to 68 maybe getting a little bit warmer if I'm baking. It took 48 hours after we first mixed together those initial 10 grams of flour and water before we were able to see enough activity to add more flour and water to it, which is called a feeding. I think that this is going to need to sit for at least 24 more hours before we need to do that again. All in all, this starter that we've kept at room temperature is just going to move a little bit slower than the other one, and that's okay. We're just gonna keep an eye on it and feed it as it needs feeding, and once it gets mature enough, it will level out, need those feedings every 12 hours become incredibly mature and ready to use for bread and transfer to your refrigerator. On the other hand, our toaster oven starter has worked much faster. Just 24 hours after first mixing the flour and water, it was ready for a feeding and it has continued to need feedings every 12 hours after that. And so this one, while the activity was great in the beginning, it's likely that the activity is going to drop. We're not going to see as much and then it's going to go up as the starter matures and becomes ready for bread and ready to transfer to the refrigerator if that's how you're going to keep your starter. So likely I will see you back in 12 hours to feed the starter and we'll just check and see what kind of activity is going on and what it looks like. It has been 12 hours since I last fed both starters, and there is something that we need to address here, and that is something called liquid separation. You can see it very clearly in the toaster oven starter, and it's also very likely to happen to this room temperature starter very soon if we don't take care of the problem. I'm not exactly sure why this happens in the first week of creating a starter, but even though we are feeding it a 1 1 1 ratio, which is always what you want to do, sometimes in that first week it gets too 
broken down, if that makes sense, and the mixture just becomes too liquidy. And so what we're going to do is we're going to adjust this. Um, there are several ways that you can do it, but today to fix this um, problem, we're either going to add more flour or less water so that we can even out that concentration of liquid and get the consistency that we're going for. Later on when you see a liquid on top of your starter, there's a good chance it's not liquid. It's probably hooch. But in the first week of life of a starter, it's a very rare that that liquid that you see is hooch. That's because hooch happens after a full life cycle of the starter has been completed. So the starter eats up all the flour, it rises, it gets to peak its highest point, it's run out of food, so it started to sink back down, and it gets hungry. And so it produces this alcohol that sits on the, that you'll notice, it'll build on the top of your starter, and that is called hooch. You can dump it off if you don't like it and continue feeding as normal, or you can stir it in if you like a more sour flavor on your sourdough. But for this first week of life, that is not the case. Our starter is not developed enough to actually go through its whole life cycle and create hooch. So what this is, it's just simply water. There's just simply too much liquid and we're going to fix that by adjusting the amount of flour and water that we add this morning. So let's quickly take a close up look at my starters just so that you can see what we're looking at here. All right, here's my toaster oven starter. Look at all that liquid. You can see based on the bubbles, there actually wasn't as much activity as you had seen before, and that is perfectly normal. But look at how watery that is. Just liquid separation. So I could leave this until tonight if I wanted to, and I could make the adjustments tonight, but because I see some good bubbles and I've had some good activity in here, I'm going to go ahead and make those adjustments this morning so that it's good to go tonight. And here's our room temperature starter. Lots of good activity in there. You can see there is not liquid separation on this one yet, but look how runny it is. Just like the toaster oven starter was yesterday. If we were to feed this like normal, just like I did, you would probably see that liquid separation on this one by tomorrow. Good activity going on in this jar though. I do want to take a quick second to note the smell of each starter. So my room temperature starter, it simply smells like flour that's been sitting in water. There's no bad smell. It does not smell like vomit, but it also does not smell like yeast. So I know that it's not quite ready yet based on its smell, but it does not have a bad smell. So that's a good thing. My toaster oven starter, it has like a little bit milder smell from before. It was like really bad smelling yesterday, but today it's really leveled off. It doesn't quite just smell like regular flour, but it is not horrible and it's also not yeasty. So I know that we're making progress and we're working on building our good starter, but we're just not there yet. So spoiler alert, I don't perfectly know what I'm doing here, um, but I do know what I'm looking for. So we're going to try something and see if it works. So for my toaster oven starter that has a lot of liquid separation, I'm going to let you look at it right here. I am, now there, there are a couple things you could do, but this liquid on top we've determined is just water. So you can dump it off, but you don't have to dump it off if you don't want to, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the amount of water that I'm putting into my jar for its feeding this morning. So I'm just going to take 10 grams of water today instead of 20. Oop, that was 20. Let's try that again. Okay, and then I'm going to double the flour. I'm going to do 20 grams of flour. That's going to give me a ratio of two to one flour to water, which is definitely more than you want, but because this is a little bit heavy on the liquid, I am just going to take 10 grams of this starter and put it in here. Oop, 15 grams, <laughs> a little bit more than I meant to, but that's okay, we're gonna go with it and see what happens. So I'm just going to give that a stir and see what it looks like here. Okay, that is super thick. And so what I'm looking for is that pasty consistency that I found before. 
but obviously what I just did here is a little bit too thick. So I'm going to add a little bit more water. Okay, let's do five more grams of water. Okay, let's take a look at this consistency really quick. This is a little bit thicker than I like it, but because we had that problem with liquid separation, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it. It's not too thick, but it's also not too thin. So for my toaster oven starter, we're going to see what this does in the next 12 hours. Here's what we're going for. That was 15 grams of water. 15 grams of starter, and 20 grams of flour that I put in this jar this morning. And for my room temperature starter, it's really a choice if you want to feed it or not. There are plenty of bubbles. I don't think that if I, I give it a feeding right now that it's going to harm it in the future. And if it does slow activity for some reason because I'm diluting that concentration of yeast that are growing in there, I'm just going to let it sit for longer and repopulate. So because we've got a little bit of runniness going on here that I'm worried might turn into liquid separation in the future, I'm just going to give it a good feeding and make sure it's got a nice thick consistency so that it continues to develop well over the next few days. So I'm just going to do the same thing here, 15 grams of water. Or 14, we're going to go with that. And we're just going to do 20 grams of flour. I'm going to go with that. And let's do, that's pretty runny. Let's start with 15 grams of starter, but I might, might go up to 20. We'll just see how it stirs. Okay. 16. That's good enough. So that was 15 grams of flour, or sorry, 15 grams of water, 15 grams of starter, and 20 grams of flour. Just a little bit of extra flour to go ahead and take out that extra liquidiness that we were seeing there. Let's give it a little bit of extra food as it's developing. We have a nice pasty consistency here. So we're just going to let this sit again and see how it does and see when we need to feed it next. So if you haven't figured it out already, knowing what to look for is key when creating a starter. You, if we had just continued feeding these the normal amount, you might continue to see liquid separation on top, think it was hooch and think that you're having a problem with your starter, but it's not. It's something that's totally normal and super easily correctable. Because we are only on day four, the activity went up in those first few days and we did see a lot of it, but now it's going to go down. So we're just going to be watching every 12 hours for those bubbles to see when we need to feed it again. We'll check on it and if it doesn't have enough activity, then we're just going to leave it for even longer until we get the good activity that we're looking for. So monitoring adjusting is super important when creating a starter and I hope that this visual is going to help you when you create your own starter if you encounter an issue like this.
The adjustments that we made at the last feed really did help take care of the liquid separation. There are no more problems with excess water and there's no more liquid at the top at all. Our starters are now exactly how they should be, although they look totally different. Let's take a look at them. Our toaster oven starter is right on track. It's looking beautiful. There's no more liquid separation here. You can see that there's a lot less activity, but we're still seeing activity. And in fact, it hasn't even doubled in size, so the activity has really decreased a lot. And that's to be expected because usually there's a surge in activity in the first couple days and then it drops dramatically. So that's what we're seeing here. And that's the good yeast taking over. That's exactly what we want. So this is right on track. Because of the limited amount of bubbles that I'm seeing here, I'm actually going to go ahead and let this sit for about 12 more hours and see what it looks like at the next feeding opportunity. So I'm not going to do anything with this one tonight. I'm just going to let it sit for 12 more hours. Our room temp starter looks quite different from our toaster oven starter. We are now seeing that surge of activity that we saw quite a few feedings ago with our toaster oven starter. It's just now happening with our room temp starter. You can see all those bubbles on top. And this starter has completely doubled in size. It is ripe and ready for a feeding. So we're going to go ahead and do that at this time. So I'm just going to feed this starter like I have before. I'm going to use a clean jar and just transfer 20 grams of my current starter into the new jar and feed it 20 grams of flour and water. But if you would prefer to just take 40 grams out of this jar and use the same one and add flour and water to this jar, that would work as well. So for me, I like to use a clean jar almost every time, just rotate between two. So I'm going to add 20 grams of water. that's close enough and 20 grams of flour okay and 20 grams of my current starter Did you hear that? That was beautiful. Just gonna give that a good mix here. Perfect. And now I'm just going to let this sit and check on it in another 12 hours and see if it's ready for another feeding or if it needs to sit for 24 hours instead of 12. I hope that by now you're starting to see the pattern and exactly what to look for. So even though our two starters are in different places, the toaster oven starter is just very ahead and the room temperature starter is doing the exact same thing. It's just taking it a little bit longer. So we're just moving a little bit slower, but hopefully you can see what to look for and what's required of feedings and how to take care of it a lot better now than you may have um, thought to do in the beginning. I'll see you in 12 hours to check on these starters once again. At this point, I'm starting to lose track of the days. I'm just feeding my starters based on what their needs are and looking for their signs of readiness. So today, both starters are ready to be fed. It's been 24 hours since we fed our toaster oven starter, and I want you to notice those little tiny bubbles. So yesterday we saw some big bubbles, but today they're actually tinier. This is because this starter, and you can see the line on the side here, it actually rose up and then it fell back down. So this is what a hungry starter looks like. 
When your starter has little bubbles like this, that means that it's time to add more flour and water to your jar, which is called a feeding. So we are gonna feed this starter this morning and then we will start feeding it every 12 hours from here on out until it is doubling in size consistently and passes the float test. While we're on the topic of our toaster oven starter, I wanna talk about why I didn't feed it yesterday. So there was enough activity in it yesterday that if this was you at your own house trying to make a decision and you weren't sure and you fed it anyways, you would be fine. But what I wanted to see was more activity because when I give it more flour and water, it's going to dilute the amount of yeast that we have in there. And right now we're just at the beginning. So we're trying to cultivate them, right? We're trying to get them to grow. But if I don't have enough, it's just going to be a slower process. So the fact that within the last 12 hours, even though I could have fed this, it rose and it fell and now it's hungry. That tells me that there is plenty of good yeast in this jar and that's going to make my starter move along just a little bit quicker. So when I feed it this morning, I should see a little bit more activity this afternoon and then I should be able to continue feeding every 12 hours and see some good results pretty soon. Now our room temperature starter is in a completely different place from our toaster oven starter. Look at that. This one has completely doubled in size. You can see all of the activity here. And it is also ready for a feeding. Now the smell, it's not as great. Um, we still have some of that initial like boost in activity that's gonna drop off a little bit later on. But um, for now, this is looking really great and I'm just gonna give it a feeding and see where it goes from here. So at this point, my feedings are starting to become really routine. I use a clean jar, but once again, you don't have to. Each time we feed it, we are just going to feed 20 grams of water 20 grams of flour and 20 grams of starter and that's going to occur about every 12 hours and from here on until our starter is mature we're going to feed it every 12 hours but once it's mature we'll only have to feed it once a week as we transfer it to the refrigerator and we'll feed it slightly different amounts because you can make bread off of this little amount of starter but you might want a little bit more yeast than that so we will ha make a little bit more starter for that once a week refrigerator maintenance, but for now, we're just building our starter off of this small amount. 20 grams of water, 20 grams of flour, and 20 grams of starter. I put a little bit of extra water in there, so I'm just matching that with the flour. That's close enough. Even if it's a gram or so off, that's perfectly acceptable. stir nice consistency here and we'll check on this again in about 12 hours and see how it's doing and for my room temperature starter, I'm just going to do the exact same thing. 20 grams of water, 20 grams of flour, and 20 grams of starter. And this one might be on a slightly different schedule just because it's moving a little bit slower. We're going to keep observing it every 12 hours. And if we need to skip a feeding to just give it a little bit more time for that activity to increase, that's fine. But if you're at this point and you are just feeding every 12 hours, that's fine too. Either way, you're going to get a starter, as long as you know what to look for, for when it's ready. You'll be good to go. Oh my gosh, we're so close. There we go. And, oof, you see those bubbles? When it's ready, it's going to do that, except it's also going to smell very yeasty. That is some beautiful activity going on in there. Ooh. And that kind of like thick pasty thing that it does, like it's, it's still a liquid starter, but it's kind of thicker as it drops into the jar. That is absolutely gorgeous. 
That's what we're looking for. And it's not ready yet, but it is going to look very similar to that whenever it is ready. Okay. I'm just gonna give that a good stir. check on it in another 12 hours and see how it's doing. It has been 12 hours and both starters are ready to be fed again, so let me show you what they look like. So here's my toaster oven starter. Lots of little bubbles here. There's been some good activity today. Not a lot going on, it's still not quite ready. Like I mentioned before, neutral smell. You can see, I can't really tell if this rose and fell. Maybe it went to here and then went down or maybe that was just me sloshing this around the jar. I'm not really sure, but either way, based on what these bubbles look like, I think it's good to go ahead and give it a normal feeding of 20 grams of flour, 20 grams of water, and then 20 grams of starter into a new jar and see what it looks like in 12 hours. So my room temperature starter has not quite doubled in size, but it did rise significantly. It's looking great, lots of bubbles there, lots of activity. It does have a slightly foul smell, so um, we're just gonna keep feeding it and that's gonna go away within the next few feedings. But we're just gonna also do the same thing here, 20 grams of flour, 20 grams of water, 20 grams of starter, and see what it looks like in 12 hours. At this point, I think I have enough film on the feedings that you don't really need to see that process anymore. We're gonna continue feeding 20 grams of flour, 20 grams of water, and 20 grams of starter every 12 hours until it gets to the point where we can transition to maintenance mode and use our starter to make bread. So I think that you've seen enough of that, but I do still wanna show you what my starter looks like right before I feed it each time so that you can see the progression and what to look for. It is day six of making a starter from scratch. And though you may have heard that you can make a starter in seven days, I don't think that's necessarily true. It's true that we have started making a starter and that we have made quite a bit of progress, but I don't believe that either of these starters are going to be good for leavening bread for at least another week. I'm looking for my starter to double in size within two to four hours of feeding, to smell nicely of yeast and alcohol, and to pass what's called a float test, which I will show you what that looks like at the conclusion of this video so that you all to know what to look for. Our toaster oven starter is coming on incredibly nicely. There is a good amount of activity. It is ready for another feeding of 20 grams of flour, 20 grams of water, and 20 grams of starter. Though it's not doubled in size yet, that means that it's not quite ready and that's okay. With consistent feedings, it will hopefully be there within another week. It does smell really nicely. Um, it's that alcohol smell is starting to peek through, though it's not super prominent yet. So that tells me that we're coming along perfectly, um, but we're just not ready. We just need to keep going for a little bit longer. Now we had a surge in activity in our room temp starter over the last few feedings, but that has completely gone away. We can see that initial decline. So we always have a surge at the beginning that goes down and then it'll slowly come back up. So that's what we're seeing here. As you can see, there's quite a lot less activity. I'm gonna let this sit for another 12 hours. Now you don't have to, you could feed it now and it would continue coming along nicely, but I'm just gonna let it sit because I want more yeast to multiply in this jar before I give it a feeding. And that's just gonna help boost how fast it's ready later. Now I want to note there is a little bit of liquid separation at the top. I don't know if you can see that there, just a little bit. And it might even get worse by the next time that I feed it in 12 hours, but I'm gonna leave it to just allow more activity to happen. And then I'm gonna make adjustments in 12 hours when I come to feed it again.
It is the end of day six and we have a problem to address with our room temperature starter. And that is the same problem that occurred on day four with our toaster oven starter. If you remember, our room temperature starter is doing the exact same thing, except it's just a few feedings behind the toaster oven starter. And this is simply because it's kept at a slightly cooler temperature. Now the problem that we're facing here is liquid separation. And I have thought that if I was proactive in the early days, I caught it with my toaster oven starter and fixed it and then I thought well if I'm just proactive and do the same thing to my room temperature starter it won't happen I was wrong it happened anyways so I don't know why this happens in the first week of life but it will likely happen to your starter and if you see this remember that the solution is just to feed it more flour or less water and it'll level out and everything will be good to go on the other hand, our toaster oven starter is coming along beautifully. That yeast alcohol smell is coming out and it's getting stronger. It's not quite where it needs to be yet, but it is coming along and will definitely be ready to use or to try out at least within the next week. Now I want to take a closer look at both starters just so that you can see where they're at and talk about where we need to go. But as for the feeding portion of the video, I have showed plenty of that in the previous days and I'm not going to be doing anything new. So although I'm going to be feeding each starter differently to treat its needs, I'm not going to do anything different. So if you need help addressing that liquid separation problem more than just me restating the directions for how to solve that, go back to day four in the morning and you can see how I take care of that problem and exactly what you should do and what it looks like. As I mentioned, my toaster oven starter is coming along really nicely. You can see lots of beautiful bubbles in there and that is just all the good activity that's going on. It hasn't quite doubled in size so that's one thing that tells me it's not ready but that beautiful smell is starting to peek through and I know that it's coming along nicely. So with consistent feedings every 12 hours this should be ready within the next week. So I'm just going to continue feeding 20 grams of starter with 20 grams of flour and 20 grams of water every 12 hours until it starts doubling in size and it can pass a float test. And as I mentioned before, I will show you what that looks like at the end of this video. As for our room temperature starter, we are facing the exact same issues we faced with our toaster oven starter just a little bit later. So here we can see that we have a significant amount of liquid separation. We have a lot less activity. And I did let it sit for that extra 12 hours after this morning when I could have fed it. And that's okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust my feeding on this one. I am going to only take 15 grams of starter out of this jar. I'm going to feed it 15 grams of water and 20 grams of flour. And that should give me that nice thick paste and kind of level everything out with the extra flour. And we will see what it looks like tomorrow. It is day seven and we are on the path to success with both of our starters, though they will both be ready at completely different times. Both starters have now experienced a rise in activity that has fallen and is now creeping back up again. Both starters have also experienced an issue of liquid separation that has happened directly after that fall in activity, which we have been able to correct by adjusting the amount of flour or water that we fed it at that time. In addition, the slightly foul smell that occurred at the beginning of each starter has now completely gone away and we're starting to see as the activity rises that the smell is becoming more beautiful and that's exactly what we're going for. Our toaster oven starter is ready to be fed on routine. Every 12 hours equal parts flour, water, and starter. So what we're doing while we're building this starter and getting it ready for bread is just keeping a small amount. 20 grams of flour, 20 grams of water, and 20 grams of starter. But I'll show you what it looks like when it's ready and when we can adjust that amount and transition to maintenance stage. On the other hand, my room temperature starter, I'm still keeping an eye on it. Because we did have that initial drop in activity and the temperatures are cooler, I'm just not seeing the same amount of activity as quickly. So where yesterday I didn't feed it for 24 hours, today I'm going to actually have to do the same thing just because that activity isn't showing up as quickly. Eventually this one's going to get to the point where I need to feed it every 12 hours just like my toaster oven starter. But because of the cooler temperatures, it's just moving at a slower pace. And in order to not dilute the concentration 
of yeast that I'm growing in here, I'm going to give it that extra time to multiply before I give it another feeding until it is ready for consistent 12 hour feedings and then later until it's ready to transition to maintenance. Here is our toaster oven starter at the beginning of day seven, which is of course ready to be fed, but not ready to make bread. We see some beautiful activity, which tells me that it does need another feeding of equal parts flour, water, and starter, but it is not doubling in size and would not pass the float test at this point. So it is not ready to make bread yet, but I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute when we get there. So this one we are moving to just routine feedings every 12 hours until it's ready. On the other hand, my room temperature starter still needs plenty of observation. You can see that activity that we saw before has completely died down. I see maybe one bubble on the top. We did take care of that liquid separation problem. Still just not a lot of activity. So I'm gonna let this set for even longer until I start to see more bubbles on top and then I will give it a feeding. So I'll check it in 12 hours and it'll probably be ready, but if it's not, I'll let it sit for even longer and then just continue observing to know when to feed it until we get to the point where it's like our toaster oven starter and it needs to be fed every 12 hours on routine until it's ready for bread. So at this point, if you've made it this far to day seven and you're seeing either of these things, Congratulations! I'm so excited for you in your future journey in sourdough bread. I hope that this video has been a huge help to you. If you have any more questions or anything that I didn't mention in this video, drop it in the comments and I will do my best to answer every single question and maybe even make a follow-up video for you so that you can see exactly what, what you need. Because you know what to look for and what to expect and because things are becoming more routine, I'm not going to show you what the starter looks like every day and I'm not going to show you my feedings anymore. Anymore. It's gonna look different for everybody, but I hope that by making two different starters at two different temperatures, you can know what kind of activity to expect. And that even if you're not seeing as much or if you're seeing things at a different pace, it's completely normal and it's going to be completely different based on your environment. So I will see you back here again when my starter is ready to make bread and transition to maintenance, and I will show you what to do. Today's the day you've been waiting for. Our sourdough starter is ready, so let's take a look at it. The first thing that tells us that our starter is ready is the fact that it has doubled in size. Also, look at all these beautiful bubbles on the sides. That is awesome. When you open up the jar, it has beautiful bubbles at the top as well as a beautiful, very strong yeast smell. I'm going to turn the volume up for a second and I want you to hear the sound that this makes when I scoop it. Did you hear that popping? That is beautiful. That is ready to go. Now the last thing is called a float test. Let me show you how to do that. So I'm just gonna add some water to this jar doesn't really matter how much but what we're going to do is we're going to see if our starter floats in water so I'm just going to take a little bit of it you don't need much and drop it in there and bam see how it floats that tells me that this starter is ready for baking bread I've changed my mind about what I'm going to show you just because this video has gotten so long and by this point I think that you pretty well understand how to feed your starter. But what I am going to do is tell you how to maintain your starter and how it's going to look different from what we've been doing to build our starter to this point. Up to this point we've been keeping our sourdough starter in a little jar and we've just been keeping a little amount. So we've been discarding only 40 grams of starter each time that we feed it waiting for it to get to this point. Now it's it's time to take this and transfer it to a bigger jar so that we will have plenty of starter for sourdough baking. Once your sourdough starter starts smelling neutral to really nice, 
that's when it's time to start saving your discard. You can simply take your discard each time, whatever's left over after you fed your starter, and transfer it all to one jar that you store in your refrigerator. It's okay to mix old discard with new discard. This discard will not go bad for a very long time. You can keep it in your refrigerator with a tight lid. It does not need to be loose. A tight lid is perfect. And unless you see mold, you are good to go. I have plenty of recipes on YouTube that use discard, as well as some additional ideas on on Instagram. You can even just do a quick Google search and find so many things that you can add your sourdough discard to. So that stuff should not be going to waste. Keep it in a jar until you're ready to bake with it and then you can throw it into tons of things. As for maintaining your sourdough starter, there are a bunch of ways to do this, and really you just need to find what works for you. I'll be showing you what my routine looks like, but this can be adjusted to meet your needs, your schedule, and how much sourdough starter your recipe calls for. Even if you fall behind on feedings just a little bit, it's really not going to hurt your starter very much, especially if it's kept in the refrigerator. A refrigerator starter, you're going to want to feed about once a week, but there are people that have gone months without feeding their refrigerator starter and have been able to revive it back with just a few feedings on the counter. So once you've reached this point, man, you've got sourdough starter for life. So I'm gonna recommend to you that once you reach this point and your starter is active and ready to bake bread, that you continue feeding it on the counter twice a day for at least two more weeks, even up to a month. That's just gonna help make sure that this is developed and healthy and strong and that it's gonna stay strong for a very long time. So when we do our next feeding, we're gonna continue feeding equal parts flour, water, and starter, just like we have before. Our regular feeding routine routine has been 20 grams of flour, 20 grams of water, and 20 grams of starter. When I bake with my sourdough starter, I find that about 100 grams of starter typically suits my needs. And so that's how much discard I like to have when I feed my starter again. So here's how I do that. From this jar, we are going to take 15 grams of starter and we're going to put it in a larger jar. We're going to feed that 15 grams of flour and 15 grams of water. So we're still doing equal parts flour, water and starter by weight. I know that's an even smaller amount than we've been keeping in the little jar, but that's because we're going to build off of that and we're going to feed it um, a larger amount later so that we don't have to discard on the next feeding. You're going to cover it with a loose lid just like you have before. And depending on your preference, you're going to do one of two things. You are either going to leave it on the counter or you're gonna stick it in the refrigerator. For the refrigerator method, you can leave it in the refrigerator for seven days before it's time to bake again. Later, you'll discover that you can leave it even longer and still revive it, but while you're new, it's important to stick to a schedule. So after seven days, take your starter out of the refrigerator and leave it on the counter. You can feed it 45 grams of flour and 45 grams of water without discarding anything. And then you're gonna let it sit on the counter until it's doubled in size or up to 12 hours. And at that that point you can bake bread. To continue refreshing your starter you'll simply get a new jar just the same I keep usually two mason jars and you're going to do the same process add 15 grams of starter 15 grams of flour 15 grams of water stir it and put it back in the refrigerator until the next week and anything that's left in your jar which will be between 100 and 115 grams if you use these measurements can go straight into your bread if you choose to leave your starter on the counter and bake bread daily especially in those couple weeks while you're still making sure that your starter is becoming a really strong culture you're going to do the same exact process except you're going to just continue feeding your starter every 12 hours so what I like to do is in the morning I will feed this big jar and when you're first starting you're just going to take it from here you're going to put in 15 grams of starter 15 grams of water and 15 grams of flour cover it with a loose lid and leave it on the counter in the evening before you go to bed you're going to add to the jar 45 grams of flour and 45 grams of water cover it with a loose lid in the morning you get to bake bread. So from this jar, you're going to take 15 grams of starter and put it in a new jar. Add 15 grams of flour and 15 grams of water. Cover that jar and leave it on the counter. Now whatever's left, which will be 100 to 115 grams of starter, you can just take that and put it directly into your bread recipe.
at any point you change your mind and you don't want to keep it on the counter anymore, you want to put it in the fridge, that's great. Or you want to bake bread more often and just want to keep it on the counter, that's great. You can go back and forth between these two methods based on what fits your personal needs. Also, feel free to add more flour and water to the jar based on what your recipe calls for. So for example, say that you had your 15 grams of starter, 15 grams of flour, 15 grams of water in this jar already stirred and mixed together, and it's ready for another feeding. Instead of adding 45 grams of flour and 45 grams of water, which will get you about 100 grams of starter. Your recipe might call for 200 grams of starter, so you need more than that. That's okay. You can simply add 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water to this jar, and it'll still bubble up and be plenty active for you to bake bread. Your cultures are well developed at this point, and you can feed it a little bit more flour and water and you're still going to get the same results. It might just take a little bit longer for it to happen, but not much and it might not even be noticeable. I do want to make a quick note about gluten-free starters. Gluten-free starters are going to perform just a little bit differently than starters that contain gluten. Not all gluten-free starters will double. A gluten-free starter that doubles is typically made with whole grains such as buckwheat, chickpea, or brown rice. I actually made a gluten-free starter out of white rice and quickly realized that it's not going to double when it's ready. And that's okay because it's going to work just as good as a starter, it's just not going to show the same signs of readiness. Look for that good smell. That really strong, good yeast smell will tell you when your starter is ready. You will also see lots of bubbles that will come all the way up to the top and that will be another sign that your starter is ready. In addition, a gluten-free starter will not pass the float test, so really you're going to have to trust your instincts and your sense of smell and really look at those bubbles to be able to determine when it's ready to use. If you're not sure, give it about 14 days at the minimum before you try using your gluten-free starter in recipes. And of course, I told you that if you wanted to use volume instead that I was going to tell you how to do that. So let's talk about it really fast. When you're making a starter by weight, you use equal parts starter, flour, and water with every single feed and equal parts flour and water for that initial feed. But when you make a starter by volume, the proportions are going to be different. You need to use double the amount of flour than water. So for example, when you're building your starter, you would want to use two tablespoons of flour to one tablespoon of water. And then when you refeed this starter every single time, you want to use four tablespoons of flour to two tablespoons of water to two tablespoons of starter. Or if you want to do a little bit less than that to keep even a smaller amount, you could use three tablespoons of flour to one and a half tablespoons of water to one and a half tablespoons of starter. So it's going to be equal parts water and starter and double the amount of flour. So for a bigger ratio that you might keep as starter maintenance, you might choose to add one cup of flour to a half cup of water and a half cup of starter to your jar. You could go even bigger than this if you wanted to and do two cups of flour to one cup of water to one cup of starter and mix that up and then let it rise. So the ratio is only different in that you are doubling the amount of flour. Because flour and water weigh different amounts, you need that extra flour or else your starter is just going to be way too liquidy. If you have made it this far in this video, wow, congratulations. I'm so proud of you and I'm so excited for your sourdough journey ahead. If there's anything that I missed, please let me know in the comments and I will either make a video on it if it's necessary or I'll try to answer any of your questions. Happy baking!